So, oh. thanks for coming to my <laughs> okay. The first thing I wanted to ask is, um, going right back, how did you get your start in activism in general, like before right, right. the Palestine issue right. specifically? Well, I'm a kind of a museum piece. I mean, I'm a child of the 60s. And um, in fact, I'm sort of uh, the archetype of the 60s. You know, I, I'm a, I did everything you're supposed to do in the 60s. First of all, I'm, I'm, you know, in the 60s, the height, the peak of the 60s was the class of 1968 in the university. It went kind of by university years. Each year was a different generation. And mine was the height of the political 60s, in the class of 68. So I um, grew up with Bob Dylan. I um, was very involved in the civil rights movement. I was in Mississippi with Martin Luther King. I was a draft resistor in the Vietnam War. I was at Woodstock. I was at the Chicago uh, National Convention in 1968. Long hair when I had hair. I, everything you're supposed to do, I did. Not always knowing it, I didn't know Woodstock was going to be Woodstock. But, um, but you know, the 60s was a very exciting time. And uh, at that time, not to be an activist on campus was weird. Mm. You know, to be a young Republican on, in the 60s was like a cult or something. Um, so that, uh, you know, so I grew up in that kind of, a, of an atmosphere, of an environment of, of activism. Um, my university was very active in Minnesota. And uh, so I, you know, that, that was sort of uh, that... And actually, I came from a small town in northern Minnesota called Hibbing. That was an immigrant town, mining, working class, socialistic, I would say. You know, I had a socialist tradition. Mm. And so, uh, and then I think my Judaism was a part of it too, because I took from the activists. You know, Jews were disproportionately involved in social justice issues. So you put all those things together and... Uh, it was kind of almost a, a non-brainer that I was going to be an activist. And um, where, at, at that time, did Israel-Palestine fit into the activist scene as a, an issue, or was it... No, issue? no, it really didn't. I mean, it was really... A, Palestine was not really an issue. Mm. Uh, it certainly didn't become an issue till after 67, and pretty much, fairly much after after 67. Um, but uh, there was another piece of that, and that is part of the 60s was a going back to ethnic identity, roots. Mm -hmm. Alex Haley had written the book Roots. Uh, African Americans were the first ones to reject the melting pot idea. They said, you know, after 400 years, we're not melting very well. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and they said, you know, we want to uh, acknowledge and celebrate uh, our ethnic heritage, our African heritage. And, you know, the roots talked about, you know, the, the coming of the African Americans to the States and all that. And then you had Cesar Chavez and the um, La Raza, you know, the Hispanic Americans. And then you had the rise of the Native Americans, people like, you know, Russell Means mm -hmm. and uh, the American Indian Movement, AIM. So that you had a lot of... Um, a lot of groups and ethnic groups saying, you know, America's okay, but we don't want to lose our ethnic heritage. Um, and I got caught up in that. So my Jewish identity became very important to me, but I'm not religious in any way. I've never been religious. And so in a sense, um, there was a kind of a shift of identity where Jewish kind of went into Israeli. In other words, I, in a way, I became an Israeli. You know, I was Jewish in a more primary, almost national form, even before I went to Israel. And so that process was essentially what led you to Israel? Yeah, and then I, I went to Ethiopia. I'm an anthropologist. So mm. I went to Ethiopia to study the, the Jews of Ethiopia in 1966. And on the way, I stopped through Israel. I stopped in Israel, and it really spoke to me. I mean... The Palestinian issue aside, on that level, it, it, it spoke to me, and I, and I, 
And I decided I was probably going to go there mm. uh, to live. But at the same time, I didn't stop being a 60s person. I didn't stop being a leftist. So I knew there was an occupation. So when I finally did move to Israel in 1973, doing my doctoral research and so on, I joined the uh, Israeli New Left. It's called Siach. And uh, I've been very involved since the first moment there in, in the political scene. Um, so, um, so mine isn't a story of some Zionist who comes to Israel, gets a disillusion, and finds his way to the left. I came on the left. And, you know, it's, um, I mean, people also, it's true, you know, you know, if you understood all this and everything else, why did you go there? Um, but, you know, today... Uh, people have a concept, uh, young people, and everybody has a concept of globalism. There's global uh, tourists, global travel, there's global, there's, everything's global. It, back in the 60s, the world was a bigger place. Mm. And we didn't really have that term. We had a globe on our desk. But um, the term we used, I think, was the revolution. And the revolution could be anything you wanted it to be. It could be political, it could be crystals, it could be new age, it could be music, it could be uh, love, you know, if you're a hippie, whatever it was, but that was our concept. So for me, going to Israel-Palestine was going to another front in the revolution. I, was, I left the United States because I thought it was pointless and meaningless, especially when the 60s collapsed, but, uh, or ended. But going to Israel, I went for political reasons. I mean, I went to be engaged. I, I knew the Palestinian issue, and from the very beginning I engaged with it. And um, on that point, when you went there in, in the early days, in the mm -hmm. early 70s, say, what was the conception of the occupation and the view of the yeah. Israeli left? Because I, I understand that at some point there was, I can't remember the exact name for it, but the, the plan, the kind of... It was going to be like a the Arab Jewish, yeah, socialist confederacy kind of thing. Ah, that kind or, of a, was that how they viewed it, or did they view no, it? As... No, 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 no. I, 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 that plan was never. Uh, there was never really a serious plan mm. like that. Not when I went, and I went before the '73 war. Uh, after '67, the occupation hadn't been really. Uh, it hadn't crystallized. You know, there was idea there was an occupation. The Labour Party didn't know what to do with the West Bank and the Palestinians. Uh, the biggest, uh, the, the, their main conception was what was called the Jordanian option. And that is with the alone plan. We take, for security reasons, the Jordan Valley, the border with Jordan. That goes, to, that's Israel because for security reasons. And all, but all the Palestinian areas, all the cities where the Palestinians actually live, revert back to Jordan, and they become Jordanians. There was never a thought at all about talking to the Palestinians or the, you know, a, a Palestinian state. I mean, of course, was, was the great fatal flaw of the whole thing. But certainly the idea was the occupation was going to end. I mean, I don't think Israel at that time it really, really conceived of... Um, of um, the greater land of Israel. Mm. That wasn't a part of the ideology of the Labour Party. That came later when Begin was elected in 1977. So there was still the idea that, you know, Israel was still kind of a socialist country. It was a Labour Party in power. The occupation could be, I mean, it was just a small thing. It could be removed. So in a sense, we were activists against the occupation. Um, but what was true at that time was that there wasn't much talking to the Palestinians. Mm. The Palestinians themselves, of course, were also in flux. The PLO itself only came into its own after 1967. You know, until then, it had been pretty much run by Egypt and, and so on. So that, so that there wasn't yet uh, a crystallized Palestinian leadership uh, that we could work with. And so it was still a very formative time in terms of, of that. And so was that seen as being, I mean, was something like the Jordanian option seen as being quite hopeful and possibly there would be just a new comfortable status quo and things would... You know, it, I mean, it's it funny, it seems very naive. You know, um, mm. issues that we have today weren't issues in those. Mm. The, the refugees was not an issue. Nobody thought of 1948. 
It has sort of happened, it was in the past. And there wasn't a strong Palestinian voice um, at that time. So, uh, so I think, you know, most Israelis uh, at that time certainly weren't committed to the occupation. You didn't even have a two-state concept at that time. That, that sort of developed later on. And the Palestinians were in a very different place. You know, the Palestinians, the PLO's position was there should be one state. But not include, I mean, they certainly didn't recognize Israel. And part of the equation was that uh, the idea was, all right, we won this war so convincingly that now the Arab world will have to come to terms with Israel. That was the hope. Mm. And I think it, was, it had nothing to do with Palestinians. It had to do with the Arab world recognizing Israel, coming to terms with Israel, Jordan in particular, that Israel actually had relations with, with, a relationship with. And then somehow things would start to work out. With, you know, the Palestinian thing would start to work out as well. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And the rise of the PLO, and the PLO in those days was, uh, didn't have a program that, it is, that Israel could deal with. In other words, the PLO's idea was one state, but and no Israel, and no Israelis in a way. The position was that Jews that had been in the country before 1917, before the Balfour there, could stay. Yeah, but another one. And then they modified it to Jews that were there before 48. But they, they didn't have any contact with Israelis, like us, like critical Israelis. Uh, so that it was a kind of a, of a relationship of, of uh, confrontation and uh, uh, kind of mutually exclusive positions. There wasn't any way, the only, um, the only group that existed at that time on the Israeli left that was talking about one state in particular was called Matzpen. Matzpen was uh, an Israeli anti-Zionist group. Some of them are still around, uh, Michel Warshavsky and Kiva Orr just died recently, Moshe Makover lives in the UK, um, uh, but um, Mat Spen was a very small radical left group that did talk about one state and, uh, and tried to make a relationship with the Palestinians. But that was it. The Israeli left, I mean, I was on the left too. Um, yeah, that, that's much the more, was much on. more, it, it was still, it, you know, everything was in the stage of still formulation. I guess you could say the dust of 67 hadn't settled yet, where, where there were clear positions, and, and we didn't have relationships yet to begin to, to uh, talk again. Mm. And um, so to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, uh, <laughs> 40 years or so. Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> um, how did the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions get started? Well, you know, um, so over the years I was involved with the with many groups on the left, and uh, um, it was, um, you know, we had the Oslo peace process beginning in 1993, and then Rabin was assassinated, and it was fairly clear even before then that the Oslo peace process was, wasn't going to work. Whether Israel had really intended that it work or not is something we don't know. I don't know. Nobody could knows if Rabin was genuinely going there or because I think he was in a process of transformation or not he was killed too soon was was that the feeling amongst the more the more more critical yeah 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 because Rabin was um, you know Rabin had a certain integrity he he was genuinely he was a thinker and he was a military guy but he was also very strategic and the feeling was that that he was genuinely in a process of seeing strategically that this is where Israel had to go. And he had never been opposed to a two-state solution. Unlike uh, Barack or Paris, that came from the right wing of the Labour Party. So, um, there were still some hopes, but we all had doubts about the Oslo process. And when he was assassinated, and then Paris came in, and then uh, Netanyahu was elected in 1996, it was clear it was over. Uh, and in fact, in hindsight, you know, Labour actually built settlements during the Oslo peace process at a pace faster than the Likud and the, and the right wing did. So 
there was never a genuine intention of going there, I think. But when Netanyahu was elected in 96, we um, uh, saw in the left, in other words, the left had become kind of dormant. Because, you know, some of us, not me so much, but a lot of people on the left, certainly the Peace Now crowd, they really invested a lot of hopes that this was going to work out. And in fact, they were very angry at Arafat mm. when after Camp David he didn't give in and he didn't do what Barack wanted. You know, in other words, uh, uh, Peace Now really s stopped functioning as a, the liberal Zionists. Um, stopped functioning as a political force at that time. They became what they called themselves confused liberals because they they couldn't they, they couldn't understand why Arafat didn't accept Barack's generous offer, even though there really wasn't a generous mm -hmm. offer. But you know, so at any rate, at any rate, we so we on the more anti-Zionist or post-Zionist or non-Zionist left, there's different variations decided we had to re-engage in fighting the occupation. It's not going to go away. And so in 1997, um, you know, we were casting around, all right, what do we do? What should, you know, and we didn't have much relations with the Palestinians at that time. So we went out to talk to them and get to know them more. And to hear from them, this is part of the anthropology, actually, comes into the story. You know, let's go talk to them and see what they suggest. And we made contacts, and we started to talk about um, what issues, uh, ending the occupation was obviously the bottom line issue for all of us, but what vehicle should we take that would make that more, um, uh, you know, that would make that kind of more uh, clear, that, that, would, that would give us a tool to, um, to attack the occupation with. And the issue of house demolitions mm -hmm. came up all the time which we didn't know very much about. And I have to say, I mean, Israel really, until today, um, insulates its people from the occupation, even on the left. So I had been, by that time, 25 years in the country. I came in 1973. Um, I had been active as a peace activist all those years. I had no idea who does house demolitions. You know, I had no idea who issues those those uh, orders, why, how many there were. Uh, if you had said there's going to be a demolition in the Nata tomorrow, I couldn't have told you where a Nata is. I had no idea how to get there. We really had no contact whatsoever to the Palestinians. And I'm talking about the more radical left. In other words, uh, it was very colonial in, mm. in, in, in a certain way. We would decide the agenda. We would say, before I can. You know, traditionally, it's, and groups, some groups still work like this. Saturday, 10 o'clock, we're going to meet, we're going to go out and demonstrate in the West Bank, and this is the issue. We go out, we talk, maybe we'd invite uh, Faisal Hussein needed to talk for two minutes, uh, some token Palestinian, and we'd go home. And that was it. And so that's what ICANN was kind of... And that's where ICANN was different. We went out, we advised the Palestinians, the issues that we took were issues the Palestinians suggested, and we decided, and this is really an interesting part of the whole thing, uh, we decided that we're going to be, well, we'll be partners of the Palestinians. That's a term we all used. The Palestinians saw us as partners as well. But we're going to be the junior partners. You see, there's no equality here. As a matter of fact, some of our members, until today, when they go to the West Bank, they bring their passports. They think we're going to another country. We're, so... Part of the ICAD dynamic that I think has, has been very good because, you know, it's over the years of intifada and disappointment with the Israeli left and there's today strong pressures of what's called anti-normalization. The fact that we're able to keep credibility with the Palestinians, we're still able, just last week we finished our 11th work camp building houses. The fact that we can still go into the occupied territories, we can still work with local Palestinian communities, we still do our work says something. And part of it has to do with the fact that we, we had to develop ways to work across a power differential. How do the oppressors, and you know, I go home every day, I don't, nobody's going to demolish my house. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, even though I'm on the left and I'm sympathetic, I'm a partner, in it, I'm still part of the oppressors. And, uh, and you know, and, and 
even unconsciously, there's a lot of ways in our interactions in which that comes, comes through. For example, if we have meetings with Palestinians, Israelis would tend to talk louder. You know, because uh, we don't have any, nobody's going to go arrest us. The Palestinians have their own internal issues, they have factions. You know, they got to worry about what the Palestinian Authority is, the Mukhubarat, the secret police, they got Israeli informants, maybe some of them are, you know, there's a lot of dynamics there that we don't, that we don't face. We work with Palestinians and it hadn't happened before. The Palestinians let, were, were leaders until today. For example, today we all know the two-state solution is gone. But I have my opinion, and I even talk about it today, about where we should go with the one-state solution. But we're not advocating a solution because we think that's the Palestinians' prerogative.